you very much, and uh, welcome to the talk, uh, Multilinguality and Language Diversity. So just a quick raise of hand as uh, friends are trickling. Come on in, uh, sit closer to the front. Uh, so how many people here speaks a different language than English? Okay, and the people coming in, how many people speak more than just English? Okay, so many of you. And how many of you speak another language that's outside of the top 10 most popular languages in the world? Very good, wow. Okay, so um, since we're in Canada, this is the Canadian language, linguistic diversity. There's more than 7,000 languages in the world, but you know, our language tools and our large language models is only, um, only limited to a handful of tools. Um, this is a, a graph breakdown of the top languages in Canada outside of English. So you can see that we have Punjabi, also Yu Cantonese, Filipino uh, Telugu, Mandarin, Arabic, some of Spanish, some of the top language makeups around Canada. And you know, being from the greater Toronto area, GTA, we definitely have a lot of language diversity spoken all around the city. So now the question for you, since most of you raised your hand, how do you interact with your second, your other non-English language online on the internet? Is there language tools that you can use? Does it work pretty well with large language models? Does Google Translate work well when you use Google Translate? So with a large influx of new population coming into Canada, there's definitely a limited access for those who don't speak English or French to have access to news, healthcare, immigration information. You know, of all over 200 mother tongues, in Canada, 20% of the Canadians report a mother tongue other than English or French. And about 6.7% of those do not speak one of those um, official Canadian languages. That's 2.5 million people not covered just within Canada itself. Um, you can think about all the countries in the world and the number of people who don't speak English. How are they going to have access to these large language models. So a little bit about myself. Uh, you can find out more about me on my website. Uh, I am currently a research professor at Ontario Tech University, you know, a brand new shiny young university in Ontario. I am status only at Toronto and I graduated from Waterloo, so some of the top computer science programs in Canada. My work is the intersection between natural language processing, AI education, and of course, um, pattern discovery and data mining was my original PhD. I worked on low resource languages. You can just think of those as languages not in the top 10, and interpretability. Uh, formerly, I spent a lot of time in industry coming from Waterloo, so I have a lot of industry experience. I'm always looking for industry collaborations um, because of my rich background in coming from industry. I am recruiting PhD students, so if anyone is interested in a PhD with me, um, you can read more about it on my website. But without further ado, my two students are gonna present the recent work they submitted to EMNLP, one of the top conferences in natural language processing, and so David is going to go first, followed by Kose. And uh, for questions, you can just save them for the end so that we can control the timing a little better in this room. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. So my name is David, as introduced. I'm undergrad from University of Toronto. So I'm going to present one of our work during my undergraduate studies, which is titled Proxy LM predicting language model performance on multilingual tasks by proxy models. So I would like to thank you, my thank my collaborators, Vinta and Dravinata, Shinili, Patrick, and Prof. Anneli for contributing to this work. So fine-tuning and evaluating language models are highly resource intensive. It requires significant amount of 
computation and time, especially in academic settings, sometimes we don't have enough GPU resources to run many experiments, especially in multilingual tasks. We want to apply this process across multiple data sets, multiple languages, and it just takes a lot of time. And for many low, low resource languages, which are languages that are underrepresented, there is a limited amount of data, and those languages are often excluded from pre-training phase of multilingual language models. It means that it's not included in part of the training um, by the large language model itself. For instance, there are many Southeast Asian or Indonesian regional languages that are not included in pre-training phase of popular language, language model like NLB. Now, one efficient solution based on previous works is to do performance prediction. But what is performance prediction? Performance prediction is an estimation task on how well a language model will perform on NLP task by leveraging its past performance records. This can elevate the dependency on extensive resources when experiments need to be performed on multiple data sets or multiple languages. Uh, to be more concrete, there's this diagram we have. So there's the data set features that we use and also the language features to represent the language rep specific representation and M, which is the model that we are interested in to evaluate on the specific task. The goal is to minimize the difference between the prediction and the actual evaluation of model M. In our case here, I will present just specifically for machine translation only, which is a task to translate between one language to another language. So there are multiple concerns regarding this framework. First of all, the current solutions are limited to same domain, or we call it homogeneous settings. Basically what this means is that the training and the test data sets are trained on the same domain or the same field. So there are no consideration regarding domain shift or difference between train and test. Another problem, it only targets high resource languages or you could say popular languages or top 10 languages in the world. So the benefit of performance prediction is not enjoyed by the case of low resource languages. Another is that current solutions are more focused on older language models, which means like Transformer or Embart that are not really recently used compared to right now, such as NLB or M2M100 or even large language models. So we introduced ProxyLM, which is a novel framework where we try to incorporate proxy model scores on top of dataset and language features. What are these proxy models? So proxy models, as shown in the green box, refer to alternative models that are smaller and more efficient to evaluate. So we can obtain the performance of such NLP tasks and use them as a helpful reference on making prediction of the performance of the estimated model, which is M in this case. So what does this diagram mean or what does these features actually represent? So in our case, we have NLP features which are from previous works. Basically includes the language features as shown, which comes from Uriel Typological Database. What this means is just a bunch of numbers or vectors that represent the distance between one language from another. And also data set features, just some statistics regarding the training and the test data set of the, our data set. We also include additional features in our work to as part of the ProxyLM pipeline, which includes the distribution, distributional shift information. Basically, it's, we are trying to measure what is the shift or what is the distance between train and test data set, so how, far it, how far it differs between them. And we also add the proxy model features, which is what we described previously, which, is, uh, which are the proxy model scores, where we just average the performance by uh, on multiple fine tuning and evaluation on identical data sets and languages. It is also flexible and adaptable because we can add how many proxy models that we want. 
or if we just want to exclude proxy models, that's also fine. Now, in terms of the model's description, we have estimated LMs, which refers to the language models of our interest, and proxy models, which are the small models we discussed. We use M2M100 and NLB as the, these are the two or most recently popular language models being used in the community. And also we use proxy models such as transformer, which are relatively small, small 100, which is a distal version of M2M100, and the non-fine-tuned versions of the estimated LMs. So no fine-tuned here means we just evaluate the pre-trained model in zero-shot manner. So there's no fine-tuning, further fine-tuning at all. Now we have two data sets just to test whether our framework is actually working or also generalizable. So we have English-centric data set and many-to-many -many languages data sets. So English-centric here just means that the data set either contains English as a source or target language, while many-to-many -many just means that the language can be either source or target. Now these, there are also experimental settings, which are to test the performance of the, regressor of the performance prediction to assess the robustness as well. So random means here, we just like randomly split, leave, out, leave one language out, means we just leave one language just for testing purposes so that this language does not appear in the training set. And then unseen here means we just use seen languages, which means that the languages has been seen by the pre-trained model and then tested with unseen languages, which means that the pre-trained model hasn't seen the languages itself. Cross data set means we train with the English centric data set and test it with many to many language data set. Now we will present the result of the benchmarks across different settings. We have more in-depth analysis in the main paper, so if you are interested, we can check it out. So throughout our presentation, we proxy LM uses XGBoost as the regressor, uh, as shown in the double dagger, because we find that XGBoost is a better regressor compared to other regressor we tried. Uh, Ensemble indicates that we are using four proxy models as the additional features, basically combining all the four at the bottom. So first, we present the English-centric dataset result. So proxy LM, or Ensemble in this case, showcases superior performance compared to all the baselines across all settings, as indicated in the green box. We also find that small 100 as proxy model for M2M100 is more effective compared to other single proxy model, which means that the choice of model architecture for the proxy model might be relevant. And we also find this phenomenon where NLB, no fine tune, as proxy model for NLB is more effective compared to other single proxy model. Now what about the many-to-many -many language data set setting? Here we see the same pattern where the proxy LM generally demonstrates better performance compared to all other baselines. Now we also try to do it on cross data set the reason why we do this setting because we want to see whether it generalizes, generalizes well for unseen data sets and also languages in the test sets during performance testing. And again, proxy LM assembles proves that it's pretty robust by outperforming the baselines that we have or previous works. We did a bunch of extra studies just to see, just to, so that we can understand more regarding this proxy LM. So we try to investigate the role of each feature by performing ablation studies on all features. And here we can see that the gap of the performance of performance prediction indicates that using proxy models actually consistently improves the accuracy. And without proxy models, we can see that data sets and language features help the performance, but it's not as significant as if we added proxy models in our features for performance prediction. Now we try to gauge what is the efficiency of our framework compared to, let's say, traditional evaluation. 
and we can verify that, as indicated in the green box, it is much faster, let's say, if we try to do traditional evaluation. So it reduces computational overhead by a lot. So to conclude, Proxy LM is a novel, scalable, and efficient framework designed to predict the performance of language models by leveraging proxy models as substitutes to estimate the performance of target model. And we showed that it is flexible and adaptable to multiple tasks, and it improves prediction accuracy by a lot compared to standard baselines, and also quite robust as well. So what is the main takeaway from this presentation? Although it might not be applicable to um, some other fields, but we, ho we hope that this might encourage the exploration of smaller and cheaper models just to fine tune of the larger models so that we may save time um, and hopefully opens uh, creative avenues for other fields as well. So I'm going to hand this to Kose for our next presentation. Um, thank you. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm, my name is Kofi Wimura. I'm a graduate from University of Toronto. Our work is called Afrit Instruct, Instruction Tuning of African Languages for Diverse Tasks. And the, from the nice collaborators uh, from the MIT, Ontario Tech, and U of T, that we are uh, pleased to submit our paper to EMNLP this year. And let me introduce this work to you. Today, the massive number of large language models have emerged, and their performance has improved by larger data sets and the model sizes, as you see on the chat GPT-4 and the, the other models. However, in low use of language context, that we see an IA and a group uh, have done substantial work to adapt LLMs to low use of languages. However, they still the of languages are only supported in these ma massive multilingual contexts, especially in African languages. So this situation requires the data set the consistently mostly on rules of languages, such as African languages in this context. To adapt LLMs to diverse tasks in African languages, that we prepared the Afri instruct data, which encompasses the various, top various tasks, machine translation, named entity recognition, news topic, news topic classification, the part of, part of speech studying, the sentiment analysis, and summarization. And also some question answer pairs from XP3 datasets that I used training the for Broom and IR. And also that we created formats, the prompt format for each uh, topic. And the, 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 and the data set is pre-processed pre pre for, for instruction tuning by creating prompts in very short ingo manner. Okay. Here is our data set summary using Lama 2 tokenizers and the language the count. The in total, 19 languages are included in our data set. And uh, this addresses the scarcity of the instruction tuning data set in African languages for training large language models. The training strategies of our model involve two stages. The first of all, that we performed language adaptations uh, using continual pre-training on African language corpus that is called URA. This extends the capabilities of RAMA2 to African languages in general. This corpus covers 16 languages in total. And after this continuous pre-training, we further conducted instruction tuning on the model to improve the perform general uh, performance in diverse tasks using lower, uh, low rank adaptations on Afri instruct data. And to determine the hyperparameters in the trainings, we evaluated the effectiveness of continuous pre-training and the lower ranks. The rank is the most important parameter in LoRa. And according to the results, the in the comparative bar in the comparative studies by rank, that we see that even ranks rank 
Celtic two performed very well, and the the other higher ranks only showed the small improvement compared to rank thirty two, and also uh, from the blue point and gray point that we see that there's a great improvement by continuous pre training uh, on the without no training the no fine tuning. Next. We compared our baseline, we compared our model with the baseline models. Our model is called upper instruct model from Billion after fine-tuned the after fine-tuned with Laura 32 on the 41 epoch. And our model outperforms the mostly the similar five models such as IR238 billion, Lama 38 billion, and also GPT GPT 3.5 Tower. However, overall, IR101 and MT013 billion achieved the best performance overall. So, the notably, the R model just outperformed by 10 points on the similar size models. Our conclusion is upper instruct dataset supports instruction tuning on diverse tasks, such as machine translation, topic classification, and more. And our model, a pre instruct model, 7 billion, enhanced by uh, continuous pre training and fine tuning with Laura technique, excels the similar five AFI models by more than 10 points. In, by 10 points. Yeah, that is the uh, a pre instruct the presentations. Uh, do you guys have any questions? And the uh, confront the for a pre instruct and the proxy LM. Okay, uh, thank you for listening to our presentation. So um, we're now open to taking any questions for either of the papers. Uh, proxy LLM, which is you know using a proxy to predict performance of large language models and then our AFO instruct modeling data set. <laughs> Anyone? Thank you very much for the presentations, especially myself being one of the BIPOC population here too in Toronto. What do you see as the upcoming applications of your research? What would be where you want it to be used first and foremost? Right. Uh, yes. So multilingual. So in terms of multilinguality and language diversity, um, we have to cover more than just English. One of the biggest topics in ACL, uh, NA, North American ACL NARCO this year was the fact that you know, language models for education only works for English. And um, you know, South American or sort of the global South languages are not sufficiently covered. Um, I think you know, where businesses are going, covering only English speakers is great. But there is a large um, amount of languages and language speakers that are excluded outside of this technology. So I think that is maybe where the research is going, definitely for the ACL community. I would say maybe some of the other communities are not um, on the same part in terms of broadening and diversifying languages, but this is where the computational linguistics community is going. And I think it's a, it's a niche that may, many businesses can probably leverage to uh, increase their customer uh, base as well. I, I might have a question. Um, maybe I maybe I missed this, but is there like a timeline to any of this work, or is it language dependent? Language dependent. Um, so this specific like, research work or, or language dependency? Like uh, yeah, like or diversification of of. Uh, right, language. right. So we have I, I, yeah. So I have a seminal paper on uh, translation for diversity of languages, and. Um, I have a nice graph there. It's not on your computer. There's a nice graph that shows like the timeline from the 2000s, right? So in translation, 
it went from statistical machine, maybe you guys would have enjoyed that presentation more. It went from statistical machine learning in like the 90s, 2000s to neural machine translation being the state of art, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the 2010s. And it all works for high resource languages, but for low resource languages, it's not really getting there. So then we show like how um, different methods have been on the rise for different languages. And for sure, you know, like the deep learning methods are increasing in popularity for low resource languages. But we all know that deep learning is data and resource hungry, which is uh, very limited. So um, the community is definitely working on this, um, collecting more data, um, creating more robust, um, robust methods. So model robustness, data collection. Um, definitely there's more data coming up. There's a couple big challenges and grants in collecting uh, Global South languages in Africa and South America. And um, African Masakane uh, NLP, which is the grassroots African data collection community, they've been sort of publishing a new data, a couple of data sets every year. So that's definitely happening, but you know, it's definitely hasn't experienced the thousands of years of prosperity that English language has. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I was wondering, for all the African languages that you um, analyzed and predicted the results for, obviously the quantity of data for each language mattered, but did the structure of the language also play a part in the results? Yes, so uh, long story short, yes, it makes a difference. Um, there are, so, so, so there, there's a couple of factors at play. So we have, we published a paper last year on performance prediction, and we found that, you know, domain shift is very important, right? Train the data in medicine, it doesn't work if you change it to e-commerce. Train the data set in politics, it's not gonna work if you change it to law. So um, data set matters, but when it comes to language similarity, uh, we have a piece of work where we're trying to, um, um, trying to make this database of languages Better. It's called lang 2 vect um, and we're trying to make that database better for missing data. It has maybe like 60% missing data for some of the languages, and they only cover 4,000 out of 7,000 languages. Um, so that's a long story. The short story is that when we do, um, yeah, so, so Riddy has another paper as well, and in her work, they found that, you know, in some, most of the non-Latin Roman script, non-Germanic languages perform worst. Um, it's just the nature of the most popular European languages. So really found that, you know, um, Arabic and Chinese perform the worst out of like a, a set of like seven languages. So we're not even moving out of the top 10 there. And then uh, for the African work, we found that anything in a non-Latin script is a little harder. So like Aramaic was one of the most challenging ones because it's just so dissimilar. Whereas a lot of African languages have a Romanized Latin script because of their colonization history. So yes, that is the long-winded answer. Uh, one more question, maybe? No? Otherwise, we can wrap it up. Yeah. Anybody? We're almost at our time anyway, so works out, I guess. All right. Okay, well, thank you for your time. Um, as always, uh, happy to chat with anyone interested in graduate studies. Me and Professor Bra well, Jeremy is here. We're recruiting PhD and master's students, so you're welcome to chat with us. All right, thank you, Annie, Kosei, and David.